Welcome to the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author, Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator, Michelle Brigman. Come here weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Hi, I'm Fawn Germer. And I'm Michelle Brigman. And this is Hard Won Wisdom. Today we are with Stacy Allison, who is the first American woman to summit Mount Everest. What a phenomenal story. And it goes well beyond that because she's a very successful businesswoman as well. And later on, I'm going to have to reveal just why I am so madly in love with this person. She's just cool beyond words, just kind to the core. And yeah. I just want to say, Stacy, welcome back. <laughs> it is my honor to be here. <laughs> All right. I'm so I'll, glad to see you. We're new at this podcast thing. Here's the story. So we, we recorded the greatest podcast. And then afterwards, we're having our banter. And Stacy goes, are we still recording? And then I looked and it was, I forgot to turn it on. So it had not recorded and she didn't miss a beat and said, when do we reschedule? Now that is a good person. So, <laughs> Right. Well, you, you cannot dwell on mistakes made. You've got to find solutions and move forward. So yeah. there you have it. So she and brought, so take two. <laughs> yeah, take two. But it's also, it's kind of the metaphor on, on what happened in climbing too. It's climbing and then learning. And so the first thing we would like is for you to take our listeners to base camp and then up and both of your experiences on Mount Everest. Okay. So what I'm going to do is actually um, talk about my first attempt to climb Mount Everest, which attempt means unsuccessful. Um, and I'll start about uh, 25,000 feet on the side of Mount Everest, saving you a lot of uh, time and energy in 45 days. Um, but we were climbing to the top. It was a summit bid. Scott Fisher, Q Bell, Wes Krause, and I. And... Um, it was a perfectly clear day, and with every step I took, I kept thinking, nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop us. And when I thought I couldn't take another step, I would look up towards the peak, and I would remind myself why I was there. And then, again, going back to counting my steps, pausing, looking out at the clear horizon, many of the world's highest peaks far below us. And one time I paused and looked ar around, and there was a bank of very dark clouds moving very rapidly in towards us. And this is the one thing that could stop us. And it's also the one thing that climbers have no control over. So we had a decision to make. Do we continue onwards to our next highest camp above 26,000 feet? Or do we play it safe and turn around and go back down? And there's, there's so much pressure to succeed. And you all know what I'm talking about. In the real world, you know, there's so much pressure to get it right the first time because you have a lot riding on it. Um, you know, for, for us as climbers, we had a lot of people depending on us. Um, you know, the time, the energy, the resources, our reputations were on the line here. Um, and so what we decided to do is we decided to push on. And, you know, the clouds moved closer and we still pushed on. And it wasn't until the wind started gusting so hard that it would actually knock us off our feet a little bit that we realized we had um, a problem. And what we realized is that we had been wearing our blinders and we wanted to see our reality the way we wanted to see it, not as it actually was. Um, so we, at that point, um, realized that we, we couldn't go up higher and sit out a major storm. We also realized that we, our external environment had changed and we weren't prepared for it. And um, it narrowed our options significantly. So we also knew that we couldn't go all the way down to base camp. So we, we did turn around, we went back down to our lowest camp. And 20 minutes after we made that decision, one of the worst storms in 40 years slammed into the side of Everest. Um, and it was basically all we could do to get back down to that camp alive where we spent five days. Um, after five days, the weather cleared up enough that we continued higher up the mountain to our next camp above 26,000 feet. We spent the next three days there. 
the wind's up high, we're still blowing over 100 miles an hour, you know, sounded like a jet engine just hovering over us. Um, and, but still we, we pressed, you know, we, we stayed on the mountain. Um, and then the question becomes, you know, how long can you stay on the mountain before you put your lives, your own lives in jeopardy and the lives of your team at base camp in jeopardy? Um, you know, it's similar to in business. How long do you hold on to something because you've always done it that way that is no longer serving your purpose? Um, well, I didn't have the courage to speak it, but Q Belk said, if I don't get down now, I'm not going to make it off this mountain. So we, we fell. Um, simple as that. Uh, we did not reach the top. How old were you then and what year was this? This was 1987, and I was 28 years old. And I didn't realize from in the telling of that you were with Scott Fisher. Yes, um, Scott, I had been climbing with Scott Fisher, and he passed away in, I believe, 1996 on um, the most tragic Everest expedition we all know about. Uh, Into Thin Air was written um, about that, that expedition. But he was like my older brother. I started climbing with Scott when I was 17 years old. I, I just didn't realize you'd been climbing there with him. So that must, I wonder what made the difference in, in his ability to turn around before and then not in 96. Um, uh, well, the, the, I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference is when you're a guide and you're taking, and you're being paid a lot of, guides make a lot of money on Mount Everest. Um, and and that is the sole reason why you try it as best you can to get your clients to the top of the mountain. And again, you know, his reputation depended on it. Our reputations were at stake on on. Well, anytime you go climb a mountain, your reputation is at stake. Um, it takes strength and courage to climb a mountain. It takes strength, courage and wisdom to turn around and, and that strength to you know, constantly look up, assess and reassess every step you're taking, taking off your, your blinders and, and paying attention to that external environment. Um, courage is simply to change when things are no longer serving your purpose. Um, and wisdom is taking the learnings from not only our failures, but our successes and turning those learnings into knowledge so that we can use it um, to get back on task. Stacey, when you made the decision to turn back and you, you know, you've referenced the, the similarities with business, right? Mm -hmm. The, one of the major things that was weighing on you was reputational risk. And we've all faced that where you have to speak up and have the courage. Was the risk, did it meet the level of expectation you had whenever you turned back? Was it as bad as you expected? Because sometimes, you know, we, we put too much, we, were, we sort of put too many limiting beliefs or assumptions. I'm curious what you learned in terms of um, being able to just say this is not the right decision and coming back and having to face the, the music, if you will. Yes, I mean, it, it, that was, we clearly made the right decision to turn around. We would not have survived up high. Um, you, you know, you, you just can't physiologically, humans were not designed to live above 19,000 feet. Um, and you, you're constantly, you cannot regenerate cells faster than you're losing them. Um, you're, the food that you do eat, and we eat about 7,000 calories a day, we're not able to assimilate that food properly. Um, so we're, we're basically starving ourselves. And then that mental stress is so intense day after day after day after day. Um, so we, we clearly made the right decision um, to turn around. And quite frankly, I've turned around on more mountains than I care to even think about. And, and the other thing I want to say is that when you climb, it's, it's really important to pay attention to your intuition. And, you know, I know in business, we depend on analytics, you know, we, we, we depend on data. Well, um, sometimes you have to pay attention to really what is going on deep down inside. If you've got a funny feeling about something, that something's just not right, then you've got to pay attention to that. And in the mountains, um, 
I personally try to pay attention to those intuition, my intuition. We didn't talk about some of what was actually driving your your desire to get to the top, the experience you'd had in your marriage, and yeah. then who you were on that trip and what changed when you went back. Yeah, so originally when I decided to climb Mount Everest, I was standing on a, a smaller peak in the Himalayas. On a, We were actually an all-women's expedition and the first women to stand on top of Amit Blom. And when I stood on top, I could see Mount Everest. It was about 40 miles away and it was another 6,500 feet above us. And it was at that moment that I said, I want to climb that mountain. And I wanted to simply know what it would be like. Am I um, strong enough physically, mentally, emotionally? Um, what would it be like to stand on top of the highest peak in the world? And so that was my inspiration. Um, but what happened is that three months before I went on that first climb, I went through a terrible divorce. And I thought, if if I'm the first American woman to climb this mountain, I'm going to show the world I'm somebody. And I'm going to show my ex-husband I'm somebody. Um, but that didn't work. And what happened on the climb is that um, I didn't care who I stepped on. I didn't care how I got to the summit. I just had to be first. Um, when my teammates asked me to do something that benefited the team, but didn't necessarily benefit me personally, I didn't do it. I was only out for myself. Um, and I knew where I was every step of the way in relationship to everybody else on the climb. It was um, very restricting. And when I got back, the thing about failure, the beauty about it is you, well, first of all, you've got to take the time to reflect, but it, it offers us an opportunity to take a good hard look at ourselves. And when I got back from that first trip on Everest, I took a good hard look at myself and I quite frankly did not like what I saw. And I vowed the next time, if I had an opportunity to go back, things would be different. I would be a team player. And I had to remind myself that I don't climb mountains to get to the top. I don't step over people. I, I am a very supportive person. And um, I had to come to terms with, with how I acted on that climb. And, and the thing that I was reminded as well is that um, when we help other people achieve their goals, we oftentimes achieve our goals in the process. And this might be a good time to just back away from Everest and um, tell you a little bit about what uh, happened before I went on that first climb. Um, I was involved in an abusive relationship um, and my uh, ex-husband, you know, divorced me three months before we, we left on that climb. And so, first of all, my self-esteem was pretty darn low. Um, and, and I thought Everest would change me, would change who I am, my status in life. Um, but it, it's not those external accolades that change you. It's really the work that you do inside. Well, Stacey, I know that something that's very important to you just from our last conversation is really self-care. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that being able to tune in and, and really take care of yourself was going to make, would be a differentiator for you in terms of the peace and harmony you found living your life? And then how do you go about investing in just your overall health and well-being? Yeah. Um, so first of all, the one thing that my um, ex-husband could not touch and that was so embedded and, and I held on to deep down inside was my climbing. Um, it, it, climbing is what touches my soul. It, it is my true passion. It reaches my, my soul in a way that nothing else in this world um, does. And so I knew he could never touch that. And so when I went after the divorce, when I climbed, I climbed with friends and family who were very supportive of me. I surrounded myself with my friends and family who um, helped, you know, um, talk me up, if you will, you know, remind me of the 
person I am and I've always uh, strived to be. And plus, I went to a lot of counseling, uh, which is really important. And I also talk about my relationship. You know, I'm not proud of it. Um, I, I wish that, you know, well, I don't even actually wish it didn't happen because it's actually part of who I am today. It has shaped me. It has formed me into the person I am today. Um, and this was, and I talk about it. And emotional abuse. Pardon me? It was physical and emotional abuse. Physical and emotional. Um, and, and, I, and the reason I'm not afraid to talk about it is because it can happen to anybody. Um, and if you talk about it in an open, honest way, you know, maybe if it helps one person get out of an abusive relationship, it, it has been worth it for me. You know, that that has been a, a big issue I've worked on for years because as a journalist, I found I could cover anything and, and they'd cheer me. But the minute I put a picture on the front page of a woman with two black eyes, the men went crazy. And mm -hmm. it's the one subject they didn't want to talk about, but it's the one that must be talked about, particularly by high profile accomplished women, because it does happen in every possible realm. And so I really salute you on that and, and you know, and bringing it back to Everest. So you're growing through this process. You had the failed attempt and then you go back as the, the new and improving you. So what, what happened on that try? There were 11 of us, um, three women on that expedition and um, the others were men. And um, basically how I approached this differently is I didn't care whether I was first, second or third to reach the top. I was there to participate in climbing the mountain. And, and really, um, I feel most connected to this earth grounded when I'm climbing, whether it's a rock face or a peak. And I wanted to be a part of Mount Everest again. Um, so it really freed me up to relax around the climb and to be present and help my teammates where I, where I could. Um, so, uh, Mount Everest is very complicated. When I climbed the mountain in 1987, 88, uh, we were not guided up the mountain. We had to set the route ourselves. So we're, we're carrying, uh, packs, we're, we're fixing rope on the mountain, anchoring into the snow and ice in case, in case we should slip and fall, that rope is going to catch us. We put, uh, ladders across crevasses. Um, we, our packs are about 45 pounds. We're carrying loads of food, fuel, and equipment, uh, trying to establish four intermediate camps on the way to the summit. So up and down, up and down many, many different times. And I was very fortunate because I happened to have been in the right place at the right time. After 21 days, we were ready to uh, go to the summit. We did not all go to the top together. It's not safe to do that. So we had enough oxygen units for six people to go at any given time, three Americans and three Sherpas. And the people who were highest on the mountain, who were also healthy, would be those first to go. And I, knock on wood, was in the right place at the right time. And so um, during the 20... During the 21 days where we're setting up the camps on the mountain, that's all a team effort. Um, when we go to the summit, it becomes an individual effort. So the, the team really, it, it, the team only can take you so far. And then in the end, it boils down to what you're willing to give. Boy, all of these um, business metaphors, aren't they? I'm telling you, they're overflowing. <laughs> and so at what point does it become individual? Uh, above 26,000 feet. So our highest camp was at 26,000 feet. So above that, you're dependent upon your own skills, knowledge, and judgment. We're not roped up. We're, we're all climbing independently. Um, yeah, we're within sight and hearing of each other, um, but it's, it's uh, definitely an individual effort. Is that and, the and scariest part? Is that the scariest part of the journey whenever it's now it's moved on to, to you? No, <laughs> I, I mean, it depends on what mountain you're on, but on Mount Everest, um, I think the scariest part 
is the Kubu Ice Fall, which is directly above um, base camp. So the Kubu Ice Fall is a glacier. It flows down the mountain, just like a river would flow. And then it drops 2,000 feet, just like a waterfall. It continues moving down the mountain about three or four feet a day. So when you have a, a solid moving mass of snow and ice that drops like that, it breaks apart, forming huge ice towers, huge slots in the ground, um, which are, are crevasses. And it's constantly moving, it's constantly changing. Those huge ice towers can tumble down, the crevasses can open up um, at any given moment. So that, that actually is the most frightening part. And, and that's where the ladders cross, is that right? Correct, correct. Can't even imagine. <laughs> so, so here you go. I mean, and, and we can take this analogy back to business. Um, every time you're, um, you encounter a challenge, you have, it's time to ante up, right? Is this truly what I want to do? Am I in the um, right uh, organization? Am I doing the, the job that I, uh, that I want to be doing? Um, when you're anteing up on a climb, you have to cross those ladders and they're, you know, they're swaying, they're bouncing. You know, you've got a hundred foot crevasse belt below you. You've got an ice tower above you. Um, and it's, it's time to ante up. I mean, if you don't see yourself reaching the top, you're not going to take the risk to, to cross the ladders. Why would you? So what is, since we're going to be on those ladders for a second, what is that like? You, you're, you're walking on. I'm, I'm pretty small. And the thing about being small is that you get to go first. I, I get to test things. <laughs> I don't know that that's and good. So it's like, okay. Uh, and, and I happen to have been on this, um, in, uh, and I should probably back up and say, when we're fixing the ropes and the ladders, we're not, again, all in there together. We, we broke our team into smaller rotations, which would be more efficient. So I happen to have been in, in the, the ice fall working with a, with a crew. Um, when we had set uh, a ladder span that was seven ladders wide. And um, so I got to go over first and I was, balancing myself, getting ready to go over the ladder span, doing my self-talk. You know, there was a 10-ton ice block perched, ready to fall. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I hope that doesn't fall. I hope that doesn't fall. And I started walking out, and I tripped, and I caught myself, but my heart was pounding away. I tripped over my crampons, which are the spikes that we wear on our boots so that we don't slip and fall in the snow and ice. And I was like, oh, my gosh, watch out for your steps. Watch out for your steps. And then all of a sudden, my eyes were drawn like a magnet down into the, the crevasse. And it was like, oh, oh. Um, and so here I am, I'm in panic mode and I get out to the middle and it's bouncing up and down like this. And, and my first thought was, I don't have to do this. I'm going to turn around. And so I did. I, I turned around and my teammates were standing there waiting very patiently for me. Um, but I have to say, because I talk about this is when I turned around, I didn't turn around with that look of horror. I turned around and I gave them that smile of oh. confidence. <laughs> because as leaders, you know, sometimes we just have to fake it. Yeah. Um, but, and, and also the big thing for me was, I mean, I, as soon as I saw them waiting patiently, it was like, oh my gosh, I can't turn around now because they couldn't do their job until I had done mine. Mm. And seeing where I had come from last year, I, I knew I was not going to let them down. So somehow I made it across that ladder span. Um, but really the, the analogy here for businesses, you know, the big picture, we all have to know the big picture, right? How we, um, where the organization is going, how we fit in. Um, but the big picture is too distracting. You know, execution doesn't happen in the big picture. It, execution happens when we focus down one step at a time, one task at a time. And then when we get, we finish that task, it's time to look up at that big picture again. Um, so that that's the same as climbing over those ladders. So then, okay, so you're heading up over 26,000 feet. It, again, it was a perfectly clear day. Um, although we had, were climbing at night at this point, and I could see the moon glistening on the peak of Everest. It was absolutely gorgeous. Again, not a cloud in the sky, counting my steps. 
And then it, uh, all the while thinking, you know, nothing can stop us, not this time. And I turned around at one point and two of our Sherpas were far below us. With them, they took two extra oxygen bottles that we would need in order for all of us to make it to the top. And they were so far below us that we could not um, turn around and go after them. So we, there were now four of us. We each had one oxygen bottle turned down as low as we could turn them down. Um, we continued climbing. Actually, we said a few four letter words, okay. but we continued climbing up to 28,000 feet. And we had a, a, an issue. We had four people, one extra oxygen bottle. Who was going to get that bottle? Well, Jim, who was the expedition leader, said, let's, um, let's turn around. We'll go back to our high camp and we'll try again tomorrow. And Steve and I looked at one another. We said, no way. We've got one bottle someone has to try. So Jim looked directly at me and my heart started pounding away. And the only thing I could think of was, let's draw straws. So we had the world's highest lottery up there. <laughs> I love and, it. Well, and I, I know what you're probably thinking is that, what? You know, we know you have a strategy on how you're going to climb Mount Everest. And you don't have a strategy for this. Well, people like to depend, again, on data and analytics to make decisions. Well, sometimes we have pros and cons. We have a decision to make that is absolutely both of equal value. Any one of us could have made it to the top. Um, and sometimes when you have to make a decision and you have pros and cons that are of equal value, you have to, it's a, well, it's a crapshoot. And um, you just hope that you're right more times than you're wrong. Um, so anyway, um, Pasong held the determining number. Steve chose eight, I chose four, and Jim chose six. And that winning number was three. So I got that oxygen bottle. And I turned and I looked up at the peak of Everest. And then I turned back and looked at, at Steve, Jim, and Pasong because they all three had a decision to make. They could risk running out of oxygen and climb to the top with me or turn around. Um, Steve and Jim decided it was not worth the risk. Pasong, however, decided it was. And um, again, I no, I have come to believe that no matter what our goals are, our objectives are in this life, um, sometimes we have to walk away from everything that has meant security to us in order to reach our goals. And also, what are you willing to risk to reach those goals in time and energy and resources? Um, what are you willing to risk reputation-wise, emotionally, to reach your goals? So give us the step-by-step, -step, the drama. Well, the biggest drama after we turned around, Pasang and I headed up, Steve and Jim headed down, is that um, at one point the wind started to gust so hard it actually blew my hat off my head. Mm -hmm. And I watched it hover in space and then drop 8,000 feet. <laughs> Well, I do, you didn't go watch it, do you watch it go down? Oh my God. You just watch it float right down the mountain, <laughs> right down the cliff. You think, um, what but, in the world am I doing right now? <laughs> no, but I looked up at the peak and I started moving a lot faster. I'll tell you that, um, you know, and, and, um, and all of a sudden I got to the point where I couldn't go any further. And that's when I knew I was standing on top. And I felt this incredible swell of emotion rise from my feet all the way up through my body. And you know how when we reach a goal and, and we're so excited and I mean, we work so hard to get there, you turn around, you wanna hug someone, you wanna share it. Well, initially there was no one there for me to hug. Um, so I stood on top of Mount Everest by myself. 15 minutes later, Passan joined me on the top and, and his joy was a joy for me to watch. Was it everything you hoped it would be? Well, standing on top of Everest is not intellectual. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. It's, it's um, you know, when you, when you reach the top of any mountain, it's really an emotional, um, uh, 
letting out, if you will. Um, it, it, it's, you know, again, you work so long, so hard to reach the goal. Uh, you just want to see it reflected in someone else's eyes. You want to share it. You want to hug someone. Um, and, you know, the, the big thing that I keep going back to, because it happens over and over again, is that, you know, we, we can't depend. I mean, sometimes in our greatest moments of glory, we're by ourselves. And, and we cannot depend on those external accolades to see us through. Um, you know, we have to depend deep down inside and know that we have done something of value, um, that something that is good. Uh, so that's what I learned up there. How big is that summit? It's, it's not like a pyramid-shaped um, mountain. So it's a ridge that you're going up, and then it just drops off on three sides. So it's not really a proper pyramid shaped summit. So how many, and, how many people could it hold up there? You know, I, I don't know. There were two of us <laughs> and we had plenty of room. So Pak Song and I, we, we took our, um, we took our oxygen units off. And so we, I was up there for about 45 minutes. And um, when I had my oxygen off, all I noticed, wait, of course you can't tell how it's affecting your brain. Um, but I, I did get cold colder because when your blood is oxygenated, do you stay warmer? Um, so and how was that view? Uh, stupendous. I mean, you're, 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 you're looking down literally on, on everything. And so what happens in the mountains is oftentimes there's a very low layer of cloud cover. And then you've got these white peaks, like little islands um, poking up through the clouds and it's, utterly beautiful. A, a lot of white, um, a lot of blue. The sky is just this light, crystal clear blue. And in that moment, were you the woman you had become or had you, did you review at all in your brain what you had left behind in order to get there? No, um, the summit is not the time to reflect. Um, the, the summit is the most dangerous place to be. Um, so you cannot let down your guard until you get off the mountain. So, so climbing up Mount Everest is not the most dangerous. It's actually climbing down. After you've reached your goal, you let down your guard, you become complacent and complacency in the mountains kills you. So, so it's not a time to celebrate. You have to get down first. Um, the, the top, what, what that's good for is um, looking out for new opportunities. Um, you know, what, what is next? Kind of, you know, visualizing a few things. You know, where do you want to go? What do you want to do after this? But, but you, you have to come off the mountain to celebrate. That must have been amazing. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will ever understand that except someone else who's done that. Well, that, that, that is true. And I, I just want to point out that, so I, I made it to the top, but the climb was not over. We still had other team members who wanted to try for the summit. So what I did was um, I went from 26,000 feet up to the top of the mountain and then all the way down to 21,000 feet in one day. And I have to shout out for women power because most people go from 26 to the summit and back down to 26 again. Um, but I stayed for a week at 21,000 feet before I even got back down to base camp to help other people reach their goals. How did that feel compared to that moment when you were at the summit? Helping other people, super excited. I mean, it, it was, um, you know, to be able to, to give back, um, it, it's important. and. Um, it's very important. How many women climbers are there now that are, you know, tackling these huge peaks? I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. Certainly not as many as um, you would think. It's, it's the, the, there are a lot of female rock climbers, um, but mountaineers who do, um, you know, the big dangerous mountains, and I'm not talking about Everest anymore. I'm talking about other big dangerous mountains. They're very few. 
I wonder what it'll take to get women to lean into, you know, this is possible for me because it's, I mean, that's a daunting, I can't even imagine. I mean, personally, I can't even imagine tackling it. I just have so much respect for you. And I think about, um, well, you know, some women just don't see it yet. Right. But, but what you have to understand is we're, we're talking about, you know, a, a big mountain. And so people really need to, if, to start climbing where they're at. Like if you don't have the skills, you're not going to attempt Mount Everest your first time. But perhaps if you try to climb a little mountain, um, you know, you <laughs> you might be able to do that. And by the way, um, I'm not climbing big, dangerous mountains at this point. I'm still climbing. I still rock climb and I still do mountaineering. Um, but for me now, it's more about spending quality time with my family and my friends. So both my sons. Um, go out and climb with me, my gal pals, um, we, we do things together. And it's, so it's about the people for me. I, I bet you feel really grateful that the time you decided to do it was back when it was such a new frontier instead of such a commercial crowded, scary experience. Well, well that's right. And, and also what you need to understand is that I had been climbing for 12 years all around the world before I attempted to climb Mount Everest. So I had the skills, the knowledge, the judgment to be on that mountain. And, um, and I wouldn't go back to Mount Everest today, uh, you know. Because it's crazy there. Because it's crazy there. <laughs> and that's not why I climb. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be in the, in, the, um, uh, in the fold, if you will, um, with, with other people. That's not how I find my joy in, in the mountains. That's, you've come so far. I'm just looking here over at my notes where the, there was this interview you once gave a long time ago where you talked about how you felt when you were in that abusive marriage. And you said you thought, no one will ever love me again. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. I'm absolutely worthless. I'll never amount to anything. And, and it, you know, if you just took your business success, you're a superstar, but you had all of this on top of it. Mm -hmm. How do other people who doubt themselves leave that behind and find the kind of power that you found? Well, I, a couple of things. First, I think um, forgiveness really helps. And I'm not talking about forgetting, but I'm talking about forgiveness, real forgiveness, where um, you don't hold grudges. Because when you hold a grudge, it weighs you down. You cannot move forward when you're um, held by bitterness. And, I'm, and I think that is a big thing. Um, again, surrounding yourself with family and friends who believe in you, who support you, um, and going to counseling. Um, because somewhere, I mean, I grew up in a very supportive family. And I had all of those wonderful things somewhere nestled deep down inside me that just needed to come forth. And I think we all have that. Um, we all have that strength and courage deep down inside. It's just a matter of finding it. Stacey, for people who want to stay connected with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you can go to uh, my website, Stacy at beyondthelimits.com or stacyallison.com. If you want to send an email, I always answer my emails. I may not answer right away, but I will get around to it. Awesome. Thank you. I tell you, I just, your story um, is just so incredibly inspiring. Just the challenges that you have overcome and we're willing to just step into a place of courage and faith that this is going, this is headed in the right direction and I'm going to come out stronger. I just, I, it's incredible just the wisdom that you gained and you're able to share with us. There were a couple of things that really stood out to me, and I thought I just wanted to, to highlight these for our listeners. So just a reminder that difficulty helps shape who we are as people. And mm -hmm. if we, we need to do things that are going to feed our soul, not for the accomplishment. You also, this was one of my favorites, where it takes courage and strength to start, but it takes courage, strength, and wisdom to know when to turn back. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned several times about how whenever you hit that big challenge, it's time to stop and reassess 
to make sure that going forward, you understand the why and to reevaluate, am I doing this for the right reasons? And then what does this mean to me? And how much am I willing to risk, whether it's reputational, whether it's life or death, whether it's um, financial, whatever it is, but how much am I willing to risk in order to proceed? And is it worth it? And I think that's just a, a healthy question to ask ourselves. I think it was beautiful at the end, um, just you sharing how forgiveness frees you. So thank you so much. You are an absolute gift and an inspiration. And it's such an honor to be able to spend this time with you. And thank you so much for being able to give us an idea of what's possible. You are just incredibly inspiring for both men and women, but just the power you give women is just fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. I'm humbled. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you for the second time. Hey, we are so glad. Thank you for joining the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Join us weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Visit hardwonwisdom.com for more on this podcast and for links to Fawn and Michelle's web pages and social media. Also, be sure to rate, subscribe, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort, and we'll see you next week.